fun. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, let us bow our heads. Amen. Yes, Lord, we bless you and we praise you. We glorify your name. Thank you for this wonderful moment. Thank you for the. Uh, thank you for this wonderful day. Uh, whatever uh, work we have done, we, we look back. We look at your grace and your favor upon our lives in uh, whatever work we do this uh, today, Lord. And this moment, we ask your Holy Spirit as we come together, the brothers and the sisters of the FMC tonight, as we meet and share the ways, your ways, your purpose in our life, according to your calling in our lives, O Lord. And thank you for Brother Mark's life. Uh, thank you for Pastor Lex and Sister Senna, uh, Brother Mosese. And we thank you for, for the brothers that is going to tune in tonight in our Zoom meeting. And we ask you, Lord, to guide us and inspire us, O oh Lord, in whatever way, according to the purpose you have called us in the FMC, O oh Lord. And uh, thank you for each and every one of us, our families, O oh Lord. We give you all the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all the people say, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Vinaka. And it's great to see your children. God loves children, and so do we all. <laughs> okay, friends. Tonight, there were a few things that we were hoping to accomplish, and I'm going to bring up my PowerPoint, as I so often do, just to help us move through that together. So the things that we were hoping to talk about were the Free Methodist Way, as we finish that, talking about God-given revelation. We were also going to, as we always do, pray for one another and share how we're doing regarding evangelism, disciple making, and what God is leading us to do next. And then we'll also talk a little bit about church planting basics like we have been. So the first thing that we were going to do tonight uh, was to hear about God-given revelation from Pastor Samasoni, but I think we all are fairly aware of uh, the importance of the Bible. What I'm going to do, though, is just ask if each of us could give one or two sentences on these five aspects of the Free Methodist Way. Life-giving holiness, love-driven justice, Christ-compelled multiplication, cross-cultural collaboration, and then I'll talk a little bit about God-given revelation. So the first thing that uh, I thought would be good as we kind of re recap where we're at, Asena, I'm so happy you're on the call. I think this is the first time and my heart is full of joy. Um, we've been talking about the Free Methodist Way, because as we're launching Free Methodist Churches in Fiji, it's important to be able, in a brief and concise way, to talk about what the core values of the Free Methodist Church happen to be, why the Free Methodist Church, why not the Assemblies of God, or the Jehovah's Witnesses, or um, becoming a Muslim, for example. Why, why the Free Methodist Church? So to be able to have a, a relatively quick and easy and compelling way to describe what it is we believe and what we're inviting people into is super important. That's why we've been focused on this. So I'm going to ask, again, there are five that we try to talk about consistently. Life giving holiness, love driven justice, Christ compelled multiplication, cross cultural collaboration, and God given revelation. 
So it's test time. And I'm going to ask if there's no, no failing here. We're just sharing our perspective. I'm going to ask, um, just kind of in a circle, I'm going to ask Pastor Lex, could you give us in maybe one or two sentences what we mean as free Methodists by life-giving holiness? Now, before you answer, I'm going to also ask Pastor Mosisi, could you tell us a little bit about what we mean by love-driven justice? And Pastor Vooney, could you talk a little bit about Christ-compelled multiplication? And then Asena, I'm going to ask you to do your best to think about cross-cultural collaboration. Now, we're going to go in a circle and share. Again, this is not a test. This is not pass or fail. There's no way that you can give a wrong answer. Um, but it's just an opportunity for us to express, again, the core values that we claim as free Methodists. So um, back to the beginning. Lex, could you unmute and tell us briefly about life-giving holiness? What does that mean? Why is that important to us? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, life-giving life -giving holiness. Uh, life. There are, there are many types of lives in, our life, in, in this world. There are lives that are not fully, uh, they are contaminated life, they are, they are crippled life. Holiness can only be manifested if you have a great life. We can all be breathing. We can all be uh, functioning, but we, we will have sickness. We will have a, a, a contaminated mind, a contaminated heart, or, or, or contaminated uh, a mindset. But what the free Methodists want is, is a holy living. You can have, cannot have holy living if you have life. Most of us, uh, even myself, sometimes uh, I feel I, I'm living, but because of the worries of this world, it will it will make me uh, not giving holiness. I won't be giving holiness because of the worries of this world. But if I if I am cast my burdens to, to the Lord, or if I do the will of God, if I rely and trust the Holy Spirit, that is the only way I will be giving holiness around me. That is the only way I will be giving holiness to my family, to my, to my church, to my neighborhood. When because there's life, because God is like the giver of life is God. Because Life is the light. This, you can have this um, holiness. Is God is holiness. The God is holy. So we are to be holy. So most Christians, most of us, we think that we are holy because we go to church. But we hate our neighbors. We have a, a bad mindset. We, we don't like it the other, the one standing before us or the one behind us or the one who is younger than us to lead us or that is, that is not giving holiness to, to where you are, giving holiness when you are fully, you have fully have that light, that, that fruitfulness mentally, physically, spiritually, the way you're going to be talking, the way, the way you're going to be seeing things, the way you're going to be treating, the way you're going to have respects for elderly or for the poor, for everybody. If you have that, then that is life. If you, if you are 
if you think you were breathing in, in that is life, that is not life. Life is when you are giving holiness, when you're producing, when holiness is coming out of you. That is giving life, giving holiness. So, so we have to change our mindset that it's not a physical thing that if you, you have breath, that is life. No, free Methodist way, it is a spiritual, uh, something very spiritual that it has to manifest itself physically. That it's not just giving you that you have breath, that, that is, you have life. You have to have breath by giving the holiness, by, by, by overcoming the evilness, by overcoming the darkness, to be the light, to be the salt. That is by giving holiness. So I would like to thank the Lord. Amen. Uh, Holy Spirit for whatever it has given me according to the life-giving holiness of the Methodists. Amen. Thanks be to God. Yes, indeed. That was excellent, Pastor Lex. We are so optimistic as free Methodists. We actually believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We believe that God's Holy Spirit is so powerful that he can give us victory over sin and give us Amen. full and abundant life, just Amen. like Pastor Lex said. We believe it's possible. Thanks be to God. So, um, I think, uh, Mosisi, I asked if you might speak a little bit about love-driven justice. Maka, can you hear me? Can you hear me? 100%. We can hear you. Oh. You are good to go. Maka. Uh, love, driven justice. Uh, first of all, is love. We know that uh, only love that uh, we are meeting today. The different uh, country far away. The love of God get us together, show us the way he drive, drive, drive us to the way, just like a driver, so we are the passenger, he drive us to his will and to his purpose. And uh, the love of God. You know that uh, the love of God, it says in uh, John 3, 16, God so loved the world, it is that he gave his only begotten son. The love of God in us, that uh, we can have the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit, that... Uh, Drive on us, lead us, and uh, teach us the way He drives us because of the love of God. And uh, thirdly, is uh, justice. You know that uh, it's in uh, Revelation, it says that uh, John look up to heaven. So a uh, white horse, there's one is riding, no one knows the name, but uh, the only name is the, the truth. The, it says in Revelation 2, uh, he, he lead us. He shows us with justice and truth, the way his word, he leads us, he leads, he acts, God is justice and God is truth. Love, 
driving justice. Thank you very much. Benaka, brother, I love the way you think. That is excellent. Yes, indeed. Now, in, in some denominations or churches, every, every focus is on whether or not I am pure and good. So it's about holiness. In some connections, it's about whether or not we're changing the world and making it a better place, eliminating poverty, combating human trafficking, stopping drug addiction, justice. But we believe the Bible says both are necessary, right? It isn't one or the other. We aren't changing the world without changing ourselves. We have to change ourselves first. And exactly as you said, Pastor Mosisi, it's love-driven. Often when we think about justice, we think about vengeance and making things right and holding people accountable. But exactly like you said, we don't get vengeance. God is the one who brings about justice. But we can advocate for justice and we seek to make the world a better place. Amen. Yes. So proud of you guys. Okay. I think I asked Vuni to talk about Christ compelled multiplication. Let's hear it, brother. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Uh, yeah, praise the Lord. Uh, Christ compelled multiplication. Uh, I believe the whole statement uh, uh, says it all. Uh, it's a, a sense, a sense of urgency to the calling, regardless of the environment, uh, the, the age, or, or the race. Uh, we have to do it according to the purpose, as uh, he said in his word, uh, for us to go forth into the whole world, uh, make disciples of all nations. And, uh, and uh, I believe uh, it is a must. We have to do it. Uh, there is no other option because uh, I, and I was um, uh, thinking of uh, what Paul said to Second Corinthians. He was saying uh, on, the, on the sixth chapter, I believe it's in verse two or three, he said, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation because he was looking. So, so that calling, even what the, the, the founding fathers of the church have, have started, so we have to continue uh, a multiplication to share Christ that this is the only way to eternal life. Uh, there is no other way to accept Christ and getting them to the full salvation of the gospel uh, in Christ. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. Nailed it, Pastor Rooney. Exactly right. Yeah, when we're engaged in Christ-compelled multiplication, it's nothing less than Jesus' great command to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I taught you. That's what we're supposed to be all about. Praise the Lord. You're an awesome Amen. preacher, Booty. Good job. Amen. As saying a welcome to the team. One of our key values is cross-cultural collaboration. What does that mean to you? And as you invite people to the Free Methodist Church, what can it mean for them? Thank you. Uh, Bula Pastor Rock and Bula to all the pastors. Uh, to me, cross-cultural collaboration is, uh, in my simplest understanding, I think it is not just a one-way street. Uh, I think it's celebrating and collaborating of diversity, being taken out from your own comfortable zone and being able to 
to present yourself to others, to your neighbors, to other races, being able to understand the view of others in biblical ways, uh, being able to work with different kinds of people, collaborating in the kingdom of God. Uh, <clears throat> I believe in uh, Second Timoth Timothy 3.16, it says, For the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. So <laughs> to bring salvation to the end of the earth, I believe that is the um, simplest understanding of cross-cultural collaboration because it does not say to bring salvation to the Fijians or to any particular race. It says to the end of the earth and the end of the earth consists of other races where cross-cultural collaboration jumps in. Uh, I also trust Bible the, is a cross collaboration book, which is not uh, meant for a particular race or a particular kind of person. Uh, it is there for every individual and uh, whoever trusts and believes that Jesus is the only way. I, this, <clears throat> I remember a well-known story in the Bible um, with a Samaritan woman at the well. And that is a clear example of where Jesus goes across that, uh, that uh, barrier to extend his hand to help, to give that living water to that Samaritan woman. So to me, cross-cultural collaboration is uh, definitely not just a one-way street. Thank you. Banaka Levi, wow, that was really good. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure that if our bishops were to have heard that, they would have said, we need a Sena to be teaching about cross-cultural collaboration all around the world. That was super good. And uh, it's funny you mentioned that it's in the Bible because tonight when I talk a little bit about uh, a principle or strategy of church planting to proclaim, uh, to speak out the good news of Jesus. Every example in the New Testament is cross-cultural collaboration, like you were saying. The woman at the well, a Jewish man, a Samaritan woman, Philip and the Ethiopian, a Greek Jew converted to Christianity, talking to an Ethiopian from Africa, uh, spreading the gospel there. Crazy, the Apostle Paul, a Jewish convert to Jesus, now talking in Athens, in Greece, to a bunch of Greek um, teachers and philosophers. It's all messed up in the Bible, but everybody has the opportunity to hear the good news of the gospel, to learn about life, giving holiness, love-driven justice, Christ-compelled multiplication through cross-cultural collaboration. So friends, where do we get all of that from? Did um, a pope in Rome 2,000 years ago make up these principles? Was it uh, a couple of bishops in America and the Free Methodist Church where we get these ideas from? No, it comes from the Bible. Everything that we believe, everything that we teach is based upon the Holy Word of God. All of these Free Methodist Way principles are only Free Methodist Way principles because we believe in God-given revelation. The Holy Scripture is the Word of God. It doesn't contain some good ideas about God. It's the very Word of God. Now, uh, I was presuming that Sam Asoni would be able to teach a little bit about that tonight, but 
we all, I think, are fairly aware of the importance of the Bible. And I'm reading from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, a verse you're all familiar with when I share it. It says, all scripture is inspired by God. How much scripture? How much of the Bible? All of it is inspired by Pastor Mosisi? Yeah. I don't think so. No. Was it inspired by Asena? No. Was it inspired by Mark Adams? I don't think so. It was inspired by God. All Amen. scripture. It is breathed by God and Amen. is profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that the people of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. The only book we actually need in the whole world is the Bible. I'm, I'm just saying Amen. for salvation and for knowing what it means to live a life that brings wholeness and justice and life and love and all of this, it flows from the Bible. You know, this book is illegal in many countries because it changes lives and, and shakes people up. It, there's power in this book because it's the very word of God. Everything that free Methodists believe is from the word of God. According to our constitution, according to our constitution, we've decided that we cannot, shall not make anything a matter of belief or practice that cannot be proved from scripture. And so, since we've been around for, I mean, the Free Methodist Church since 1860, that's not that long. Uh, but since we've been around that long, part of the Methodist movement, founded 100 years earlier than that, part of the Christian movement started with Jesus. We've always come back to questioning, is what we're saying aligned with the scripture? Every question we have about whether or not what we believe and what we're doing is good or, or bad, we base on scripture. And so um, if anybody asks, what do free Methodists believe? A real simple thing is we believe that the Bible is the word of God. Amen. And the word of God teaches us that salvation is found in no other person than Jesus Christ. Amen. And Jesus Christ teaches us that we need to go into the whole world. That's cross-cultural collaboration. That's where we get that from. To the whole world. And we need to make disciples of all people, teaching them to obey what God said. Make disciples is Christ-centered multiplication. That's where we get that from. It's from Jesus' great commission. And then what's the great command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's life-giving holiness. Love God with everything you are. Let the power of the Holy Spirit fill you with everything that God has in store for you, and your life can be forever changed. Life-giving holiness. We learn that from the scripture. And love God, love people. When you are expressing love-driven justice, it's nothing other than loving people the way God does. You don't want people to live in brokenness. If there's a way for people not to be living in poverty, we'd like that to happen. God doesn't want that. God wants people to have resources. If we can help, let's help. When we don't have resources, let's hope God can help us and others can too. We provide love for others in tangible ways. That's an easy way to talk about justice. The point is everything that we believe comes from the scripture. So I saw a message saying that somebody is trying to get in and waiting. Sorry, let me read that. Pastor Sal is awaiting acceptance from his side. He's been messaging that he's trying, but I don't see that he's actually uh, waiting. So, hmm, usually just if you're texting Pastor Sal, thank you for that, uh, whoever notified me. 
could you uh, let him know that he should log out and try again? Because I usually get a cue when somebody's trying to log in. Thank you. Uh, I'll pass the message. Very good. And um, yeah, so uh, hopefully he can uh, log in. He's really amazing. Um, all right, so what we're going to do in the meantime, uh, any questions about the Free Methodist Way? Ah, now he's coming in. Very good. Any questions about the Free Methodist Way? And tonight in specific, God-given revelation as a core value. If you have no questions, that's perfectly fine. If there's anything you'd like to say, that's perfectly fine. Pastor Sal, Bula Bula, welcome. I'm so glad you can make the call Bula, today. Bula, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, my brother, I have to tell you, you missed your brothers and sister teaching Man. about the free met this way. They were fantastic. Fantastic. Amen. Amen. So are there any questions before we move on to the next segment of our meeting? And I, the way I do this is I'm just going to ask by name. And if you don't have any questions, you don't have to ask any, but I just want to give everybody a chance. Um, Pastor Lex, any questions about the Free Methodist Way? Uh, yes, sir. Um, this is a question just to... Uh, I'm just, uh, I think, this is my thought. I think, but you have to, to straighten me on that. Uh, love, driven justice, and, uh, and uh, by giving holiness. In my mind, I think love, driven justice has to be, to be in front then life giving holiness to be the second one just uh, tell me <laughs> again you said it <laughs> hey uh pastor lex when you share the free methodist way with people if that's how you want to share it you have my <laughs> blessing yeah now, and oddly enough i think god-given revelation goes first because it all okay. depends upon the Bible. Oh, uh, right. So, you know, they're, they're really, this, they, these aren't listed in order of importance. So it's all, not important, the orders. Right, yeah. It's, just, it's like, it's like um, I love my house. Which part do I love more? Do I love the left window or the right window? Do I really like the front door or the back door? You know, I love my house. So, <laughs> so okay. you, but when, but when you share this, you will have passion over particular areas. Share what your passion is. That's how the Holy Spirit is leading you. So, sir, that's, as long as it has five, as long as it's five. Yeah, it, yeah. And it's just a simple way. Again, the Free Methodist Church, all churches are more than five things. But this is just a simple way to describe the Free Methodist Church. If somebody asks, what are you all about? This is what we're all about. It's a simple way to communicate. That's all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good question, by the way. Um, just so right now in the United States, people are being nominated for bishop. And it's funny, this happens every four years. That's how we operate. So it's funny because some of the teams or groups that are asking questions of candidates are like, well, which one of the free Methodist ways do you like the best? It's like, that's like, which one of your five children do you love the best? You know, it's, today it's the one that that didn't spill the milk all over the table. But you know, <laughs> I love all my children. I love all the Free Methodist way. Uh, Pastor Mosisi, do you have? Thank you, Lex. That was great. Do you have any questions? Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> 
something in my throat. Do you have any questions? Good to go. Pastor Vuni, do you have any questions? Uh, no, Pastor, but I've been blessed uh, listening to the sharing uh, tonight. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Good, good. Uh, Asena, any questions? No, sir. Okay, Sal, you, Pastor Sal, you need to know, Asena really rocked it tonight. I mean, she did a really good job describing cross-cultural collaboration. Pastor Sal, you've been uh, studying this for some time. Do you have any questions about the Free Methodist Way? I'm seeing no. No, no, no. It's all clear. Very good. Thank you, much. Okay, friends. Um, again, this is a simple way that we communicate. When you're launching a new church, it's good to be able to tell people what we're all about in a simple way. So uh, hopefully this is all very helpful. And that's why we've been leaning into this for a while. Now, we often around this time break up into groups and we ask ourselves four questions. What are you hearing from God and what are you doing about it? How are you doing evangelism and what's the result? Who are you developing as a leader and who are they leading? And what's the next step of obedience that you're feeling the Holy Spirit lead you to? But what I'm gonna to do tonight, instead of breaking up into groups, is I'm going to ask one of those questions, and we're going to go around in a circle and share. Um, so tonight, on our church planting teaching, we're going to be talking about the strategy of proclaiming the good news of Jesus. So the question I want to ask tonight is, uh, over the past month, have you shared the gospel with anybody that wasn't already in your church. If you didn't, that's okay. Don't make up a story. Uh, all of us have, you know, life and sometimes we do and sometimes we don't have an opportunity. But if you have an opportunity to share the good news with somebody, tell us about it and tell us what happened. And uh, we'll rejoice over that. And I'm going to go in a different order than we have been going. I'm actually going to ask uh, Pastor Sal, you're going to lead us tonight with this. And then um, I'll ask Vuni, and then I'll ask Mosisi, and then I'll ask Lex, then I'll ask Asena, and then I'll also go myself um, and share as well. Pastor Sal, have you had a chance over the past month to proclaim Jesus with somebody that wasn't already in church? And uh, how did that go if you did? I uh, think you might, uh, to be honest, uh, for the past month, uh, I'm still uh, working with my family, starting from uh, within and trying to move out. So at the moment, I'm still working with my family and together with the extended family that I have. So just for that uh, note, uh, Mark, uh, what we are, what I'm trying to do now is try to work on my family first, yeah, my family, and uh, with my extended family. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Uh, yeah. That's where things start, by the way. <laughs> Pastor Vuni, have you had an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with somebody that wasn't already in church over this last month? And if so, how did it go? Uh, thank you, Pastor. Uh, yeah, um, probably I think uh, last month, uh, a work colleague um, uh, and uh, Indo Indo Fijian uh, work colleague, uh, a woman, uh, she's married, and um, they were in a the process of uh, separation, divorce. <clears throat> and uh, she was like uh, seeking uh, solutions, answers, uh, seeking uh, 
to to solve the problem she went through. So I was, and the uh, the thing because I wasn't uh, fluent enough in um, speaking in uh, Hindi, so I led her to a to a pastor's wife. And since uh, she's a female, so I led her to a pastor's wife, Christian, uh, nearby church here, and uh, gave her number. I made them uh, contact each other, and uh, and after a month, and they are together again with the husband. Um, Praise the Lord. I was uh, not. Uh, I was not blocking her. I was not telling her to come to church, but I was sharing. I was sharing um, that with God, nothing is impossible. Even your unbelieving husband, even you. Uh, she once heard about Jesus uh, in her teenage uh, years. And um, she was asking me, you have experience. She was asking, was telling me, can you tell me what must I do? So the best thing I did was I told her about Jesus and uh, and I led her to this uh, to this uh, pastor's wife, and she was fluent in Hindu, Hindi speaking. And uh, after a month, uh, they were, were together again with her husband. They went to courts. They settled in courts, and now they're together. So I was thankful enough, though though I didn't bring her into the Methodist church in the Free Methodist church, but I had an opportunity to share. Yeah, Christ and, 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 and the fruit of it, um, they are back together with a husband. And, uh, and again, last week, my wife uh, was sharing when I came back from work. Uh, she was saying that a uh, neighbor, she was uh, having problems to the wife of a neighbor. And uh, so my wife shared the same thing. Um, and she's willing, she's willing to, to come to church with us uh, in, uh, one Sunday. So yeah, I tell her, hey, it's okay. Let's bring her on. Uh, yeah, that's, I think, uh, I believe uh, where God works in mysterious way, though we never bring them into the Methodist, free Methodist, just, but we share the gospel, yeah. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we definitely want to bring people into the free Methodist church, but it's more important to bring people into the kingdom of God. Jesus is a lot bigger than the free Methodist church. So thanks be to God. Way to go, brother. Um, Pastor Lex, have you had a chance to share the good news with somebody outside of church? And how did that go? You'll need to unmute yourself, my friend. Sorry, sir. Uh, yes, uh, last two weeks, I, I met this uh, old friend of mine. Uh, and, uh, as soon as we met, we started sh uh, sharing his excuse he got for a, for a, for a, for a mobile company. But he's, um, he's a Seventh-day seven Adventist. So he was asking me which church did I, am I still uh, in the, oh, because we were in the same church back then. And I said, no, I have with free Methodist now. And uh, he asked, so how are we operating? How are we? And, and I was uh, sharing, sharing with him the, the, our ways of uh, dealing with the, with the Bible. And, uh, and he's, now he asked me if I could come on this every Sunday at 2 p.m. to to where he's to where he's to where he's I mean he's excuse me to where he's working. So I didn't uh, went last uh, Sunday because of the I was engaged with my mother and I told him that I'll be coming this Sunday at 2 p.m. Praise the Lord! That's great. Super glad to hear that. Wow, we're having some budding evangelists. I love it. Pastor Mosisi, have you had a chance to share the good news of Jesus with somebody outside of the church this month? And what was that like? 
Naka. Just want to share apa uh, really 12 or 18 years I met another one of my friends who's an Indian who's in his uh, 30s yeah. we were together in the Greggy that's my my village my my province that together so last sunday i was going to church connect to the marriages united here in nawa and uh you know about to go in front of the group the driving the church so i looked back i saw him so he doesn't recognize me so we met there yeah. he's wearing a traditional sulu Man used to wear go to church, but he was a Hindu. And hey, I met him, we speak each other. Hey, long time. Yeah, long time. What you doing here? So he said, uh, What you doing here? So we laughed and uh, we started sharing. But uh, after four years, we had a stroke. He's a Muslim. Uh, sorry, he's a, he's a Muslim, yeah, he's a Muslim. Hmm. And the uh, last four years, he had a stroke, and uh, it was really <laughs> bad. It affected uh, his life, his body, on the right hand, right side of body. And uh, it, uh, uh, it uh, affected him and uh, he can even walk and uh, he called in four years time. He's calling and uh, he sent to like he can't open it, can even talk. So he met uh, some of our friends, they gave their life to the Lord, then they are in another ministry in the Krati. So before we used to hang around with together and met them. And here was a past the and they invited him, they pray for him and uh, God uh, healed him. Wow. And uh, in four years he recovered again. So started to change. He was born again, baptized. And uh, we met that Sunday was, and uh, we were sharing how good the Lord, uh, his love in us and uh, how God can lead us, heal us, whatever uh, hard circumstances or ways we go through but the word of God we stand because it's the way, it's the life. So we still, we were sharing in the church. And I was sharing about myself too. So, uh, nearly a year now, three years. I met the Lord. I, I mean, uh, this ministry, I was sharing to him too about the, uh, the ministry, the church, primary this. Oh, okay, so he he was on his way to another another church, Assembly of God uh, ministry, just serving Christ, and uh, we were standing right in front of the church, the marriage church I'm connected, and uh, he was sharing to me, and uh, you can feel the love of God, Holy Spirit, how good. God uh, is loving us. And uh, actually, I'm, uh, okay, uh, it's about time now, the church about to start now. And uh, he said, no, we go together inside. We said, okay, let's go. And uh, we were sitting there 
all of the children's uh, eyes are looking at him because he's uh, Indian. First time for them to see an Indian boy sitting inside the Yiddish Sulu. And uh, the pastor was uh, preaching. And he was sharing about, uh, about uh, how uh, he, he shared the word of God to a man. He was, he, he was, he was uh, struck in, the, in, in God. The same thing that uh, my friend was sharing to me and uh, we were sharing outside. And uh, the pastor was telling a story, the same as what God is. Uh, uh, he prayed for that, uh, that man he was struck with. So I just stepped his leg and said, this is your message. And, uh, they start from the day we were calling each other. And uh, how, uh, you know, the, how, we, how God put us by the, the ways that we can call it uh, the, the, the revelation of the word of God. It connects us, connects us, the nuts we are sharing and the pasta inside. It connects. And uh, I thank God for that. And uh, the friends too, I was sharing to them too. But how good God is, church, and uh, I'm waiting for God's time. And uh, yeah, thank you. Let's get uh, Joan to thank God, and thank you very much. Yeah, Vinaka, fantastic. Praise the Lord. By the way, it's cross-cultural collaboration and evangelism and disciple-making all wrapped up into one with a whole lot of love and life transformation. Way to go, Pastor. Asena, uh, do you have any stories of how you shared the good news of Jesus with somebody over the past month? Uh, yes, I did. I met a friend of mine, I think it was last two to three weeks in town. Uh, we went to the same, uh, congregation we used to attend before they shifted from the urban to the rural and uh, they planned to make a trip to the city last two to three weeks so i met her in town um they have uh they in a state of i can say they 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 are backslided at the moment so they are trying their very best as soon as we met, she, read, uh, she said that uh, um, I'm so glad that, uh, that, um, that we were able to, that I was able to meet you today. So I went like, uh, what was the problem like? So she, she shared her problem to me um, and I started to share her uh, this common free Methodist way, love-driven justice. I used to hear Pastor Lex sharing every now and then during our devotion at home. So I started sharing with her and uh, she kind of, uh, she liked it. And uh, she got hold of my number. Um, She's looking forward before returning to the rural where they are now. They decided to be making plans to the husband. Yesterday, she called me, they're making plans. They would like to attend the church before they return to the rural, get some kind of um, uh, <clears throat> disciplinary note from uh, our uh, spirit field pastors here in Fiji. So yes, I think uh, I did. <laughs> Thank you. 
Amen. That is great. And yes, you did. That, that was exactly right. Thanks be to God. This is how the church grows. This is how lives are changed. So as a superintendent of churches, I spend most of my time going to church meetings and I'm in churches in multiple states. But my spiritual discipline is that when I'm driving, if I see somebody stranded on the road, I stop to help. And that's an opportunity to share the good news that I have with people outside of church. So um, a few weeks back, I was driving and I saw a car stop on the side of the road and the door was open and the guy was just sitting in there, but he was slumped over his steering wheel. And I thought that doesn't look right. So I stopped and um uh, he had urinated uh, on himself, and he was incoherent. Turns out he'd had a heart attack. And when it was a difficult to have him speak, I called an ambulance. The ambulance came. So um, I didn't actually share the gospel with them because I thought it was more important to get him medical care, and he wasn't responsive. But I did hook him up with a pastor in San Francisco who's able to follow up with him. Um, but many times along the road, uh, when I stop to help people, that's a great opportunity to share the good news of Jesus um, in my context. So thanks be to God. I'm just, I'm gonna just pray for y'all. God, thank you so much that you have allowed Pastor Sal to bring good news to his family, to begin to build from the inside out the kingdom of God, that you've used Vuni in a powerful way with a colleague at work to be able to help a family going through divorce and absolutely unsure about what next steps are, to discover hope and power in you and healing as a result. Thank you, God, that you've allowed Lex to be able to share Jesus and the Free Methodist Way with the Seventh-day Adventists and to begin to bring an opportunity to have Bible studies and regular connections with this person. May it bear fruit. Thank you, God, that uh, an Indian Muslim is able to hear the good news of Jesus through Pastor Mosisi. Continue to give him power through your Holy Spirit to break through all spiritual bondage, to have a heart open and set free in Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, that you've given Asina opportunity to reach out and share even love-driven justice and the love of Jesus with friends. And I just ask that this would be a great opportunity for these people to have fullness of the Holy Spirit when they return home into the village where they're from. Just bless them there. Lord, continue to give us fruitfulness as we share the good news of Jesus. We have no power on our own, but all power comes through you, Lord Jesus. We just ask that you would pour it out upon the free Methodists in Fiji and allow your movement to take root and to grow in hearts. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Uh, very excited. Okay, are we up for about another 30 minutes? Can we hang on for that? Amen. Okay. Well, um, what I'd like us to do is just have a recap on church planting strategy. That's kind of what we're talking about over the past several months. And tonight we're going to be talking about the strategy of speaking out, which is what we've actually been talking about and praying about right now. So let's have a little bit of a recap. Um, Asena, this is for you. You get a recap here. Everybody else knows all of this, uh, but it's good to have a reminder. So I always do a bit of a reminder. We started talking about milestones for a church. What is a church? It's conceived in heaven, then is gathered on earth when you proclaim and gather people in the name of Jesus. But a church isn't really a church if it just stays as a Bible study or a worshiping group until 
you send church planters out and give birth to new churches. So we've talked about this as the biblical way of thinking about church. Conceived in heaven, gather, conceived in heaven gathered on earth, but then sent out to multiply. That's God's plan. Then we talked about what constitutes a church. There are three things, the three C's. There's a covenant that we actually agree we're a church. We, we call ourselves the body of Christ. We call ourselves a church. We're not just a group that's trying to do good things for the community. We don't just sing songs. We're about, you know, all five of the Free Methodist way, and we're together, and we agree that we're a church. There are regular characteristics of a church, and the characteristics, as we've talked about, are really the seven commands of Jesus. So a church will always be leading people to repent and be baptized, teaching people to pray. That's the first thing the disciples of Jesus asked him to teach them. We have to pray. And in that, we pray through the lens of the Bible. Third, we worship together. And the way Jesus talked about instituting this was communion. So the act of having communion of the Lord's Supper is a key part of Christian worship, according to Jesus. So that's one of the commands of Jesus, and we practice that as a church. Jesus taught us that the main thing that we need to do with one another is love. Love is the key ethos, the key characteristic of every Christian. And so we learn to love each other first and love the world uh, outside. I don't mean the worldly things, but I mean the people in the world outside. Jesus also taught us to give. Every Christian disciple is also a giver out of our means to the church and to people in need. And then seventh, real simple, make disciples. It's a command of Jesus. So those are the seven commands or characteristics of the Spirit-filled Great Commission. And then the third C is the charismata, that is, fullness of the Holy Spirit. Every member of the church is living out all of the power that God has given them and their distinct spiritual gifts. Those gifts can be gifts of service, administration, healing, miracles, speaking in tongues, teaching, apostolic ministry, etc. all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So anyways, a church can be three people, it could be 3,000 people, but a church has to be characterized by understanding we're a church, by understanding we obey Jesus. The seven commands are a simple way to think about that. And by understanding everybody can and should be full of the Holy Spirit and gifted to carry out the will of God, right? So three milestones, the three C's. And then last month, we started talking about the five strategies for church planters. It always starts with prayer. And we really drilled into that last month. The second strategy is to speak out. If we don't tell people about Jesus, uh, nobody's going to know about Jesus. It's that simple. The Bible says, how will people know unless somebody is sent to tell them the good news? So we speak out. When we speak out, the third strategy is to gather people that respond, which is something you're already doing. And when people are gathered, what do we do? We teach them to obey the commands of Jesus. It's not that difficult to think about what we need to do as a church. It's pretty simple. And when people learn to obey, we're sending them out. Those are the five strategies. So I want to talk about the strategy of speaking out. And I want to use three different examples of this. Next week, I'm going to ask us to talk about what is the gospel and how do we share it. And I'm going to give you homework to present create a gospel presentation, and we're going to share that together. But for now, just some biblical understanding. Um, there's three examples in the Bible that I think are really helpful to see how in the New Testament people speak out about Jesus, including Jesus himself. So, um, those three are Philip and the Ethiopian and the Samaritan woman, which Asena reminded us of, and Paul in Athens. So with each of these, we see a few key things that take place in 
the particular story. If you have your Bible, then I would welcome you to, to turn to these passages. The first one is Philip and the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8. I think we probably know the story, but I'm going to uh, read it, beginning in verse 26 of Acts chapter 8. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he got up and went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading from the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard the Ethiopian reading Isaiah the prophet. And Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian said, well, how could I unless somebody guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture, which the Ethiopian was reading, was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation, for his life is removed from earth? The eunuch answered Philip and said, please tell me, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from the scripture, he preached Jesus to him. And as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. And answered, he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the Ethiopian ordered the chariot to stop. They both went down to the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when he got out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but he went away rejoicing. So I read the story while you were looking at the summary. You know the story, right? We're talking about cross-cultural collaboration as Philip who is a Greek-speaking Jew, also, by the way, a deacon of the church, full of the Holy Spirit, is prompted to go and hang out with somebody very unlike him. He goes to talk to the Ethiopian eunuch, the treasurer for the nation of Ethiopia. So this is a a very big shot man. This is a head of state visiting in the area. Philip is not a head of state. Philip is an average working man like you and me. And the Holy Spirit tells this, and all of you are far above average. I mean, nothing bad by that. But none of us are kings or presidents or heads of our state. And yet, Philip was asked to go and speak to this head of state who was very different. I think that's interesting, don't you? That God would give somebody enough boldness to speak to somebody of great power and influence. It's another thing to notice that the Holy Spirit prompted Philip to go and listen not to go and tell the Ethiopian anything in specific, just go and be with him. And so when Philip does this, he goes and he's listening, and the, and the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian who had his manhood cut off, is reading a passage in scripture that's essentially saying, People who have had this happen will have nobody in future generations and are cut off from the people of God. 
So the question that's on this head of state's mind is, I'm reading in Isaiah about a person like me. I've had my, my manhood cut off. And they don't have any share with the people of God. Do I have a place with God? Is it even possible? That's a big question. And so it's important that Philip was there. He listens. He hears. This is this person's struggle. And Philip starts by talking about that person's struggle. The scripture says Philip begins to speak from the prophet Isaiah and shares with him the good news of Jesus as a result of that. So even if, I don't know how the conversation went because we, we don't hear what Philip ended up telling uh, the eunuch, but I could imagine it was something like, even though you can't have natural children anymore, God can allow you to have a fruitfulness and a spiritual life and spiritual children and a spiritual inheritance with the kingdom of God because Jesus died on the cross for you. You are now a child of God. Nothing will cut you out of the people of God. No matter what other people have done to you, it doesn't matter. What God has done for you through Jesus is life transforming and you are now a child of God if you just say yes to Jesus. Amen. And the next the next response is like, show me the water. I want to get baptized. You know, it's like, bring it on. I love it. So this is an example of proclaiming that uh, is, is very powerful. Understand that when you proclaim the good news of Jesus, whether it's to somebody of great power and who has authority over you, or somebody who may even be your servant, or somebody that might be very low in social status. It doesn't matter. God loves everybody, right? The power of the Holy Spirit transcends all of that. But not if you think you already know the answers before you have a conversation. Philip wasn't told to go and give a specific presentation with three points. He was told to go and listen. Understand what this person is struggling with. And then help them see how Jesus is the answer to their big question. This is how we proclaim the good news of Jesus. So... I just kind of summarize it here for you. The Spirit leads Philip just to be with and listen. The Spirit, uh, you've already shared stories today about how the Spirit has led you to just go and be with somebody, a, a, a person, an Indian going through a divorce. Wow, what? Praise the Lord. So you might be very different from that person, but you listened. And when you heard their struggle, their, their spiritual question, you were able to take that and talk about how God loves them and can bring restoration at their point of need. Now, another thing to note that happened with Philip and the Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 40, is Philip did not make the Ethiopian go through 12 weeks of classes before he could be baptized. As soon as he had faith, he was baptized. As soon as somebody says yes to Jesus, take that as an invitation to immediately welcome them into the family of God through baptism and bringing them into the community. The Ethiopian thought he was cut off from the family of God. Philip says, no, you're a key part of the family of God. Jesus died for you. By the way, uh, if you know any history um, of Africa and of Ethiopia, early church historians say that this Ethiopian eunuch, who was the treasurer under Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, actually returned and shared the good news of Jesus with Candace. Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, was converted to faith in Jesus because of the witness 
of this person that we read about in Ethiopia, when you read Ethiopians history of that nation in Africa, it is the first African nation to be Christian. It continues to be the oldest Christian church in the world is the Coptic Ethiopian Christians. And it all comes from this particular story. You never know when that person you share the gospel with may go back to their village of Sena and want that fullness of the Holy Spirit, and you think you're never going to see them again. So I don't know, maybe something good happened, maybe it didn't. But that person might become the pivotal leader that brings about transformation in an entire village, on an entire island, in an entire nation. You never know. When we proclaim, have faith that God is at work. Any amens? <laughs> Amen, amen, amen. Well, okay, so, amen. so let's just quickly touch base with the Samaritan woman, too. Can we do that? Yeah, I know that you want to. So, in John chapter 4, verses 4 through 42, it's a very long text, so I'm not going to read it all. I think you know the story. But in John chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, Jesus and his disciples are going through Samaria. And Jesus sends his disciples out to get a bite of lunch to bring something back. And Jesus hangs out at the community well, where there are likely a number of people getting water. And one of them is this woman who, well, as we know, because Jesus has a conversation with her, has a very rough background. She's been in a number of marriages. In that culture, by the way, the man controls the marriage. So whether she was a good woman or not, that isn't told to us in scripture. But we know that if there were multiple marriages, it was likely her husband's previous husband's decision to allow her to leave, per se, or to kick her out of the family. Rough. She's had a rough life, but she's getting water from the well and has this conversation with Jesus about a normal thing. I'm thirsty. Give me something to drink. But he turns it into something spiritual. Let me tell you about living water. And then they have a little conversation about what's the nature of, you know, real worship. Are, do do real followers of God worship in Jerusalem alone, or can they also worship in Samaria? And Jesus has some answers to her questions and ends up saying, you know, I'm the Messiah, by the way. She says, well, this is all really tough stuff to figure out, but when the Messiah comes, he'll give us all the answers. And he goes, yeah, well, I'm, I'm him. I'm the guy. So he, he's having this conversation with her. And then it's just, Totally, totally amazing. I'll stop sharing the screen. You know the story. It's totally amazing. The first missionary in the Bible is this woman. Oh, Jesus comes and he shares the good news with this woman who has a very broken background. Her life has been so hard. And because of this conversation, she's like, yeah, I think I just met the Messiah. And she goes back to her village. Again, as Sandy, you never know what happens and people go back to their village, right? So uh, she goes back to her village and tells people about her experience with Jesus. And she gathers a crowd. See what we're talking about with church planting? She didn't even know she was a church planter. But there you go. She says yes to Jesus. She goes and begins to proclaim what she knows, speaking out. And then gathering. That's how you start a church. That's what she's doing. Now, here's the crazy thing. As you read this scripture, notice the disciples come back with lunch. Remember, Jesus sent them out to get lunch. So now they're coming back with lunch, and they see Jesus talking with this woman. And they're like, why are you doing that? Uh, it's kind of inappropriate to be talking to a woman, especially a Samaritan woman. It's like, uh, Mosisi is like, what are, you, what are you doing talking to a, a Muslim about this? I mean, should you really be having those conversations? The answer is yes, because Jesus did. And the, and the disciples were confused. It's like, no, we, we need to be building ourselves up. Jesus says, no, the gospel is for the whole world. The gospel is for broken people. The gospel is for everyone. 
So anyways, good news. She goes, she shares Jesus, and they come back, and a, a spiritual movement starts in Samaria. So what do we see again? We see Jesus setting the example of going to a, a place where there's people and then listening and having a conversation and allowing the struggles in this case of that woman to guide where that conversation goes. And as that conversation goes to her brokenness, to her questions about worship, he's able to talk about who he is. So in both of these cases, Philip and the Ethiopian, Jesus and the Samaritan woman, the example is don't go with the preconceived notion of exactly what you're going to say. Go with the spirit-filled desire to hear the struggle of the heart of the person that you're going to talk to and then have some knowledge of Jesus about how you can bring the good news of Jesus to bear upon their struggle. Now, we saw in the Ethiopian case, Philip didn't say, you have to go to 12 weeks of classes before you can be part of our church. He said, let's get baptized now. You're in. You said yes to Jesus. You're in. And now that you're in, go tell the queen about Jesus, right? It's all good. Samaritan woman, same thing. Jesus didn't say, don't tell anybody in Samaria about me until you've gone to 12 weeks of Bible study, because you probably won't really know what you're talking about. No, it's like, hey, go tell people what you just experienced. All right. That's that's all you need to do. Proclaim what you know. Movement started. Friends, churches kill themselves when they think they need to control the move of the Holy Spirit, and when they think they need to teach everybody everything you can possibly know about God before you can share about God. Let me tell you, none of us can possibly know everything about God. God is infinite. Amen. God is beyond all of us. There's never enough. I mean, we can always grow in our knowledge, but we'll never have enough knowledge to say, I know everything there is to know. I'm finally competent, right? Can't happen. But we can say, I know I've been loved by God, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I know God can love you. That I know for sure. <laughs> All right. So one more example, because I know you want it. I know you're thinking, give me one more example. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so here, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul. I love Paul. Paul is, by every account, a short, little bald guy probably had a beard because most people that were members of the Sanhedrin and were Orthodox Jews as Paul was. The picture I have looks a little bit like Paul pretty much, except Paul didn't have glasses. Anyways, so imagine this guy who goes way out of his comfort zone in Acts chapter 17. And actually, I am going to read uh, Acts chapter 17. It's a little bit shorter, but uh, it's so much fun. I'm, I'm just going to read this. Okay. So we have Jesus in the countryside at a well in Samaria. We have Philip talking to a head of state in a, a coach, like a taxi cab. And now we have Paul going to a big university. Kind of cool, right? So uh, here we have in uh, Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 21. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing this city full of idols. Notice that. So Paul is in this city. He's, look, he's seeing that Ain't nobody worshiping Jesus here in Athens. There's a bunch of false gods everywhere. And the spirit moves within him. He's troubled by this. So, uh, verse 17, he began to reason in the synagogue with Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. So note, Paul's talking to two people. 
Sal, you're talking to your family in church. That's awesome. That's what Paul is doing too. He's like hanging out with his synagogue. He's saying, let's talk about Jesus. But he's also hanging out in the marketplace where everybody who doesn't know Jesus is hanging out. This is Paul's intention. Every day he's hanging out there. And also, uh, there were some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, verse 18, who were talking with Paul, and they were saying, what does this idle babbler want to say? And others said, he seems to be proclaiming strange gods, because Paul was preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. So in this case, these Greeks had never heard about Jesus, and they didn't know much about Judaism. They knew about their pagan gods. So when Paul is talking about Jesus, it's like, oh, this is one other God that's being talked about. We never heard about this one. Let's hear about this God. We, we've got like 30,000 gods. Let's, let's hear about this one, too, even though Paul seems like a babbling idiot. That's what it says. The philosophers thought Paul, the apostle, was a babbling idiot. I'm just saying. People are going to think you're a babbling idiot, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So anyways, um, verse 19. So these philosophers took Paul and brought him to the Areopagus, which was like a university where people would have conversations about philosophy and about the gods. And they say, they ask, can we know what this new teaching is that you're proclaiming? Because you're bringing something strange to our ears. So we want to know what these strange things are. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in every respect. For while I was passing through and examining your objects of worship, I found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, let me tell you about the real God, the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he's the Lord of heaven and earth, he does not dwell in temples made with human hands. He's He's not served by any human hands as though he needs anything because God gives to all people life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. And he goes on and he preaches this amazing message. And uh, he summarizes it by saying, God has fixed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, Jesus Christ, and having furnished proof to all people by raising Jesus from the dead. Verse 32, now they heard of the resurrection from the dead, and some began to sneer and ridicule Paul and said, mm, we might want to hear about this again in the future. But Paul left some men joined him and believed, while others did not. All right, so here's the thing. Oh, I'm sorry, I just, I, I just love this story. Paul is assumed to be a moron because he's talking about the resurrection, which sounds like a fairy tale to these great thinkers of the day. But for humor's sake, for grins and giggles, as we say in the United States, they thought, well, we'll have Paul over and let him talk. It'll be a good laugh. We can listen to the country idiot share his silly tales. So Paul gets an in, like an in, he gets the talk. This is cool. He should be offended, but he's not. He knows this is an opportunity. What does he do? He starts by affirming them. I happen to notice that you're very religious. That's a compliment. I'm very religious too, obviously. I'm talking about religion. And as I walk around your city, I notice you're worshiping lots of gods. I worship God too. In fact, he says, you have one idol to the unknown God. Well, let me build on that. Let me tell you about the unknown God, because I know the real God. And then Paul uses that as a segue to talk about Jesus. And he says, you thought I was talking about a fairy tale, but the bottom line is this. Your gods are made of stone. They don't talk. 
they don't really listen. My God was crucified dead in the, in the grave, and on three days rose again from the dead. I saw it. Hundreds saw it. It's real. My God's alive. So y'all got to choose. You can worship these statues of stone. Hey, it's your choice. Or you can follow the God who's alive and actually listens. It's a great message. It's fantastic. And the result is most of the people still laugh at him. But a handful, the scripture says, decided to become Christians that day and to follow him. These were university leaders, these were philosophers, these were community leaders that then became followers of Jesus. Okay, uh, interesting stories, aren't they? Yes, sir. Amen. So, see Paul, like Philip and like Jesus, hanging out in church, but also in the marketplace. That's where people are buying and selling. As a result, he has conversations with people some think he's an idiot, but they ask him to talk anyway. He tells them about the resurrection, and it blows their minds. So not everybody accepts Jesus, but some do. Here is something that's, and I could have used so many other passages of Scripture, but understand these three super important aspects of how you share the good news of Jesus. You have to go where the people are. The Holy Spirit will prompt you, but you can't proclaim Jesus from your living room, and you can't proclaim Jesus just from a pulpit in church. You have to be where people are. When you are where people are, you don't have to worry about what you're going to say. You really don't. You just have to pray and listen, and people will talk about what their needs are. They'll talk about where they're hurting. They'll talk about the problems they have. And that's where you can talk about the power of Jesus, where you unite the gospel with their current need, the power of Jesus to touch whatever their particular point of pain happens to be. That's how you proclaim the good news of Jesus. If you're talking to somebody and, and they're saying, I'm really sick, pray for their healing. You're talking to somebody and they're saying, my, my marriage is broken. You know, don't start talking about the book of Genesis, and let's talk about the beginning of time. Talk about God loves you. He really has a plan for your marriage. Let's pray together about how God can bring about healing and see what God can do. Start to follow Jesus and things will fall in place. And whatever the problem is, it doesn't matter. Jesus always has an answer. But as you proclaim Jesus, always start with the person's problem. Always start with the person's pain. And God will come through. Um, Amen. So how does that feel as a strategy for speaking out? Hang out where people are, listen to their problem, and then tell them how Jesus can meet that problem. Sound okay? Okay. Amen. Good plan. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, uh, that's kind of the lesson for today. So uh, praise the Lord for that. I hope that you found it to be useful. What I would like to ask is for this assignment. Okay. And the assignment, the assignment for us is always, by the way, speak out, right? So you're already doing that. Each one of you have given great testimonies about how you're speaking out. Never stop. I won't stop. Every time I see somebody on the side of the road, I stop. Sometimes the guy having a heart attack, as it was a couple of weeks ago. But usually it's somebody in trouble, and I can pray with them, and I can talk to them about Jesus. Wherever you are, whatever the problem is. Here's what I want you to do. Here's your homework. I want you to describe, come up with how you present the gospel. That is, what is it that God has done for us through Jesus Christ? What is it that God has done for us through Jesus Christ? And how do you invite somebody then 
to accept Jesus, to receive Christ in their heart, to agree that this is what God has done for us. I want to be a follower of Jesus. So however that looks like for you, what is that? Um, and I'll, I'll also share next week some ways I do that. So I'll share, for example, next week, I use a, a pattern called Romans Road, where I have some verses in the book of Romans that I've memorized that I can really help people with pretty quickly. You might have some other ways that you like to share exactly what Jesus has done for us. So whatever that is, come up with how you tell people what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about next month. Okay. Is that a confusing request or do you understand what I'm asking for? We good? Lex? Good. Sal says we, good. Uh, I didn't get that. Sorry, sir. Uh, we have to describe how we how we present the gospel? Yes. Yeah. In your own words, if you're yeah. talking to somebody and they have a need and you find out what it is and you want to tell them what God has done for them through Jesus Christ, how do you do that? What words do you use? Are there a few key Bible verses that you point to um, when you're talking to people about Jesus? Okay. And by the way, um, yeah, we're not, I'm not looking for a research paper. Uh, just very simply, how do you, how do you share what God has done for people through Jesus Christ? Why is it good news? <laughs> why, why would it, why would gospel means good news, right? Why is it good news? Um, and this is also God-given revelations and key values. So where in the Bible do you see that? And perhaps that's helpful when you point people to faith in God through Jesus Christ. Sal, did I hear you about to ask a question? Uh, sorry, Mark, just to make it clear to my colleagues, it's just how you approach the people. You approach the people for and to teach them about, uh, or talk about Jesus Christ and sharing with them. I think that's what uh, you really want to mark. Yes, exactly right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'm going to share my screen again very quickly. So the next time that we meet, um, I double check that date. If October 19 is a Thursday, <laughs> uh, that's when we would be scheduled to meet. That is the wrong day. That's what I thought. All of a sudden I had a heart attack. It's uh, October 20. So pretend I'm not showing the screen. <laughs> it's October 20. <laughs> Delete that screen from your memory. <laughs> As usual, I'll send out an email reminder. But um, thank you. Uh, yeah. And then uh, David Clemente, I believe, is coming also in October. I don't know many details about that. Uh, has that been arranged? Lex, have you been talking to Pastor David Clemente at all? Yes, uh, yeah, he's, 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 it's been arranged and uh, he has confirmed that uh, he'll be in Fiji at the 7th of October. Very cool. Um, well, good. He's a good guy. You're all going to love uh, hearing his perspective, and he will love hearing yours. Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, any. Uh, well, here's how we usually end, right? John Wesley would ask with all of his small groups when they were wrapping up, "Is your heart clear?" And if there's anything that you need to uh, to bring up or talk about to be clear, now's a really good time to do that. Um, otherwise, you can simply say, my heart is clear, and we'll, we'll finish the call that way. And I'm going to ask, um, uh, let's see, Pastor Mosisi, when we're done, could you close us in prayer? 
So uh, in my screen, I see Lex, Vuni, Asena, and Sal, uh, and then uh, Pastor Mosisi, I'll ask you last so you close us in prayer. Uh, Lex, is your heart clear? Are there any questions or anything you'd like to raise before we end our meeting? Praise the Lord. Uh, I would just like to thank the Lord for the opportunity. And I would like to and uh, thank you. I would like to thank you, Mr. Mark, for the presentation, for the, for the teaching. And I would like to thank our Pastor Sao, Pastor Balindrokondroka, Pastor Buni, and my sister Asena. And with me, all is good. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Pastor Buni, is your heart clear? Is there anything you'd like to share before we close our meeting? Uh, thank you, Pastor Mark. Um, I want to say a vinakavakalebu to you and all my colleagues here in Fiji. And uh, also, sir, forgive me uh, regarding that assignment. I think it's been a long time now. I haven't uh, sent the assignment, the questionnaire, I think, uh, regarding the questionnaire, because uh, I think because uh, the laptop where I stored all my assignment, uh, someone uh, took my laptop without asking it. So uh, please forgive me to give him more time for me to complete it. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, Pastor Rooney, though, I think you actually sent me the assignment. I, I have, um, I'm pretty sure I have everything. But if not, oh, believe me, uh, send whatever you would like to send. <laughs> well, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's all is well, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks be to God. Uh, Asena, is your heart clear? Is there anything you'd like to share? All good, all clear from my side. Thank you. Thanks be to God. It was so much fun to have you uh, on the call today. Really uh, wonderful. Uh, Pastor Sal, is there anything that you'd like to share? Is your heart clear? Thank you, Pastor Mark. My heart is clear. And thank you very much for the teaching this evening. Naka. Bless you. Thank you. Um, my heart is clear as well. It's a joy to see everybody. And uh, Pastor Mosisi, you are our closer, our anchor, our strength tonight. Tell us, is your heart clear? If you have any questions, and then lead us home with prayer. My heart is clear. Thank you. Thanks be to God. Oh, let's also remember, of course, Pastor Samusoni and uh, uh, Pastor Philomoni. We missed them tonight. Naka. Okay. Go ahead in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for teaching, for your word. Thank you for the richness of your word, the power of your word. I want to give like thanks to you. Thank you for the superintendent, Mark Adams, giving me time to be sharing, leading us the way we met this way, five years. You share today. Thank you for the knowledge. Thank you for the wisdom. And thank you for your Holy Spirit uh, teaching us, leading us, and uh, showing us the deeper of your way, of your word tonight. We thank you for. From South and the family. Thank you for the 
Kemudian ada Athena, The Family, Thank You Atas The Bunny, and The Family. We pray for, for Samson P2, Asta, Samson P2, and The Family, and uh, the bless us all. And uh, lead us the way you already set in us. It's like your purpose. It's like your word says, your purpose, your purpose, your will, will stand in us. And uh, we give you back uh, the big thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Anaka, brother. We'll see you in October. Amen. Anaka.